Well, hello everybody and welcome to what is our closing live session for the Predictive Toxicology Academy. So our topic of focus for this week is looking at improving usability of cellular cultures. And today's webinar, um, it's entitled Looking at the Advantages of XVs, 3D Bioprinted Liver Tissue in Capturing the Complex Cellular Events of Monocrolatine Induced Liver Injury. And it's brought to you today by Organovo and Pharma IQ. So I'm your host for today, Shanice Henry, editor of Pharma IQ. And so just to give you a little bit of an insight for what today's webinar will be looking at. So we'll be exploring how um, 3D bioprinted tissue stands as a unique model in capturing complex toxicity phenotypes. Also looking at how the physiological interactions of multiple cell types is necessary to capture the cascade of events resulting in drug-induced liver injury. And we'll also be looking at the utility of 3D bioprinted tissue in assessing both time and dose-dependent tissue responses, pro-inflammatory signals, and histological events as a result of insult. So the x technology is recognized as a very innovative um, toxicology model, um, so it's a very apt um, way to have our last closing session for the Predictive Toxicology Academy. Okay, so before we get going then, I'll just remind everyone that it is an interactive session. We'll have a slot um, for Q&A at the end um, of our presentation today. Um, so do feel free to ask any questions. You ask those in the right-hand side chat box um, that's on your screen, so it's on the screens on the right-hand side, um, and then we'll be able to get around to those uh, when we get to that Q&A section. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for today. So we have um, Dr. Umesh Hanumi Gowda. Um, he's a scientific director from Vive Healthcare. Um, so to give you a bit of in, insight onto his background, um, so prior to joining Vive Umesh was a toxicologist in discovery, toxicology at Bristol Myers Squibb for over 12 years. Um, his expertise is in pharmaceutical toxicology, specifically in investigative and mechanistic toxicology. Um, so it's great to have you with us today, Umesh. Um, so I'll I'll you know hand over the reins to yourself and please uh, begin when you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you, Shanis, for the kind introduction, and uh, uh, thanks to Pharma IQ for providing me the opportunity to, to talk about this really interesting project that we did with Organovo. Uh, the title, as Shanis pointed out, is uh, Monocrotalin Toxicity in ex vivo 3D bioprinted human liver tissue. Uh, now, uh, I should be upfront about the support provided from uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. And as, uh, as pointed out earlier, uh, this project was done while I was at Bristol Myers Squibb. So uh, BMS uh, sponsored and funded this uh, project completely. And this was done in collaboration with Argonovo using uh, Argonovo's XVIV 3D bioprinted human liver tissue. Now, um, I don't know how many toxicologists are there in the audience, but I'm sure you would, you would agree with me if I said that as a toxicologist myself, that we keep looking for novel in vitro methods that can predict toxicity or more so even address mechanisms of toxicity, especially the events that would occur in a chronic setting. And while we were looking for such models, while I was at Discovery Toxicology at BMS, we came across this XVIV 3D liver model. And it's a fascinating model and thought, and we thought, let's test this model. And after considerable thought, uh, we picked monocrotalin as a test compound. And I'm sure at this point, uh, most of you will be wondering uh, what a pharmaceutical company is doing with uh, monocrotalin. The short answer is that we picked a really difficult compound to challenge the XVIV 3D bioprinted human liver tissue. So I will start with a brief background of monocrotalin. Um, what it is, and how the toxicity of monocrotalin looks like, and how did XVIV 3D perform with monocrotalin challenge. So what is monocrotalin? It's a plant toxin. It's a pyrolizidine alkaloid, and the structure is presented here on the right. and um, 
uh, it's prevalent in several uh, plant species, mostly in Crotalaria, Senecio, Heliotropium, and Symphytum plants. And um, it's estimated that about 3% of all flowering plants contain some type of pyrolizidin alkaloid. On the right hand side are the photographs of two such plants. Uh, one is the Crotalaria, commonly known as Rattlebox. The other one is Symphytum, which is commonly known as Comfrey. And these two plants are quite commonly used in herbal remedies and uh, herbal drinks such as the bush teas. Now, monocrotalin is toxic to humans and animals. In fact, the toxicity of monocrotalin in animals is very well documented, very well known. The mechanisms are quite clear. Human exposure occurs by food, usually by a contaminated uh, grain, and also by consumption of some herbal products, such as the herbal teas or herbal remedies, and even low-level ex exposure occurs by consumption of honey, uh, milk, and meat, um, although at very low levels. Um, in fact, epidemics of uh, pyrolizidin alkaloid toxicity, especially the liver toxicity, has been reported in uh, several countries. And usually this happens in places where there is uh, the quality control of food is not optimal. Uh, even in industrialized countries, low-level exposure uh, do occur uh, by contaminated grain that makes it into the food chain. Now, why study monocrotalin? Now, we established monocrotalin is toxic to humans and animals. And interestingly, monocrotalin has got multiple target organs. It is hepatotoxic in animals and humans. In an acute setting, it causes something called as the sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, or uh, also called as uh, the hepatic venoocclusive disorder. And in chronic exposure, it causes fibrosis and even is carcinogenic. In fact, uh, monocrotalin is demonstrated to be carcinogenic in rodents. Monocrotalin also causes uh, damage to the lungs. Uh, it's pneumotoxic. It causes pulmonary hypertension. And with chronic exposure, it also can cause pulmonary fibrosis. Now, this particular compound, monocrotalin, is bioactivated to a reactive metabolite. And because of the reactivity, it is genotoxic as well and also has a potential to be teratogenic. Um, and more so, from a research point of view, it is a model toxin for research. In fact, several researchers have used this compound, monocrotalin, to develop animal models of sinusoidal obstruction syndrome to study the hepatic venoocclusive disorder uh, pathogenesis. And it, people have also used monocrotalin to develop animal models of pulmonary arterial hypertension and in a chronic setting to induce fibrosis in liver and lung. So as you can see, Monocrotalin has got a really complex uh, multiple uh, target organs and a complex mode of action that makes it really challenging to uh, work with in an in vitro setting. Briefly, let's go over the mechanisms of monocrotalin liver toxicity. Now, we are focusing only on the liver toxicity right now. now Monocrotalin by itself is not toxic. It needs to be bioactivated to a pyrrole, which is the monocrotalin pyrrole, to be toxic. And this bioactivation occurs by the action of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Now, monocrotalin pyrrole is reactive 
and usually it is detoxified by the glutathione system within the hepatocytes. And since hepatocytes have got good uh, glutathione detoxification system, the pyrrole is usually taken care of. But when the system is overwhelmed, this monocrotaline pyrrole can bind to protein or DNA, causing adducts. And when the system's really overloaded, this pyrrole can leave the hepatocytes and get into the general circulation and start uh, moving on to different uh, distant organs, and that's how it causes the um, lung and renal toxicities. Now, the immediate um, target for this monocrotaline pyrrole once it exits the hepatocyte is the endothelial cells because th these are the endothelial cells in the liver. And because the endothelial cells have a lower level of detoxification mechanism, they are, uh, they are more prone to the damage induced by monocrotaline. So once it forms uh, the protein DNA adducts and damages the endothelial cells, the endothelial cell injury will in turn trigger an inflammatory response causing neutrophil infiltration. And once the neutrophil infiltration starts to occur, there is production of reactive oxygen species, inflammatory cytokines, and there is a bigger spectrum of toxicity that sets in in the liver. And in parallel, the endothelial cells that are injured, they start detaching from the sinusoid and they start occluding the sinusoids in the liver causing the sinusoidal occlusion syndrome. And this contributes to the parenchymal injury. And this is an acute toxicity that occurs by the detachment of endothelial cells leading to liver toxicity. But if it occurs at a lower level and with an ongoing inflammation, it triggers additional events such as tissue re remodeling, stellate cell activation, and in a chronic setting leads to development of fibrosis. Now, as you can see from this, it is a really complex mechanism that requires bioactivation. So that means we need metabolically competent cells to produce the uh, monocrotaline pyrrole. There are multiple cell types involved, and there are multiple layers of toxic inserts, and there is both dose and duration dependent effects, ranging from acute liver toxicity all the way to development of fibrosis. Now, this is how the monocrotaline toxicity looks like in the rat liver. On the top panel is the um, normal liver, and on the bottom panel is the monocrotaline-treated rat liver. And this is an immunostaining for perlican, which is a heparin sulfate proteoglycan, a component of the basement membrane uh, in the liver. And uh, the staining looks really well here. Architecture is perfect, while with treatment with monocrotaline, as you can see, the architecture is quite um, distorted. So it loses the architecture in an acute setting. Similar finding when we stain for collagen 4, another component of the basement membrane. Um, it's a protein in the basement membrane. So again, similar a phenotype, a loss of morphology, uh, especially in the central lobular region. And when we stain with another um, antibody to the hypochlorous acid modified proteins, on the, on the top control liver, you don't see anything. With monocrotaline treatment, we see the occurrence of this hypochlorous acid modified proteins. These are essentially from activated neutrophils and suggesting that there's an inflammatory component that is ongoing in the acute monocrotaline-induced liver toxicity. Now, what is shown here is an acute liver toxicity induced by monocrotaline. 
What I am not showing here is the chronic toxicity because we didn't do a study to look at the chronic toxicity, but it's very well known in the literature. There are several publications showing the chronic toxicity of monocrotalin. Essentially, after dosing for three to four weeks, the morphology, the pathology is different in that there is onset of fibrosis. And I, I, we don't have the data to present here, but it's quite well known in the literature. So, the, the basic question here is, can monocrotalin liver toxicity be captured in vitro? As we reviewed, um, monocrotalin toxicity has got a complex mechanism and a complex pathology. It requires bioactivation, that means metabolically competent cell type. It requires multiple cell types like endothelial cells, stellate cells, to capture the right pathology. And it requires the right architecture and also the proximity of cell types because the pathology is directly dependent on the concentration of monocrotalin pyrrole that's available in the vicinity of the cells. And also, it, the model should be amenable for long-term exposure because these are changes that takes place over time. And it also should be amenable for histology so that we can do a much more detailed um, histologic analysis to see the sequence of events. Traditional in vitro models, such as a two-dimensional cell culture, cannot capture monocrotalin liver toxicity. So, we challenged, can ex vivo liver tissue capture monocrotalin-induced liver toxicity? Now, before going into the actual study and the findings, uh, I will briefly go over the ex vivo uh, 3D human liver tissue model developed by Arganovo. Uh, XVIV is a 3D bioprinted human liver tissue. It consists of primary human hepatocytes, uh, primary stellate cells, and endothelial uh, cell line. And once printed, uh, these are uh, biopsy-sized liver tissue, as you can see here. And they are maintained in transfer inserts uh, covered by the media, and the printed tissue has a compartmentalized architecture showing distinct zones of uh, non-parenchymal and parenchymal cells, and they have sustained function and viability, which is presented on this slide. So, uh, on the top panel, are the sections from the ex um, liver tissue. The first one is stained with albumin and e -caterin. Albumin represents the functional healthy hepatocytes and e showing the junctions formed between these cells. And the second one, the middle panel, shows the staining for the endothelial cells using CD31 and for stellate cells using Desmin, and they show a real unique morphology, as we see in the staining. And even ultrastructurally, uh, by electron microscopy, you can see hepatocellular polarization with evidence of uh, mature bile canaliculi and junctional complexes. So the architecture looks liver-like. Now, looking at the function, it's impressive to see that XVIV 3D has got function all the way up to day 28 and probably beyond uh, relative to a two-dimensional uh, uh, culture. Um, in fact, the albumin production goes up as it progresses uh, up to day 28. And also the function of CYP3A4, the expression and both expression and function of CYP3A4 is very well maintained. And in fact, the, the XVIV3D retains the ability 
for induction with rifampicin. So it's really impressive to see that the 3D model has got both the function and uh, the both the architecture and function maintained very well over prolonged periods of time. So thanks to Argonovo for providing these two slides to me. Now let's move on to the study that we did. Um, here is the design. So essentially what we did was um, we took this XV 3D bioprinted tissue and exposed the tissues to monocrotalin at uh, a, a different uh, different concentrations ranging from 0 to all the way to 2 millimolar for a, a 7 or 14 days. And during this time, the media was changed every day and we also collected media on days 1, 3, 5, 7 and 14 for analysis of LDH, a marker of uh, the toxicity, also albumin as a marker uh, of the function of hepatocytes and also we looked at cytokines. And at the end of 7 days or 14 days, the tissues were processed for histology and we did uh, special staining to look for the endothelial cells and the stellate cells. So this is the general design and here are the findings. LDH release was monitored as a marker of a cell damage and albumin was monitored as a marker of hepatocyte function. And as you can see here, um, there was no real significant increase in LDH release. The only time we saw um, an increase in LDH release was uh, with treatment with a high concentration, about 2 millimolar monocrotalin on day 3. So there was only a transient increase in LDH release at the highest concentration of monocrotalin. On the contrary, the albumin production was significantly affected and we saw this effect at uh, not at the lower concentration of 20 micromolar but at 200 uh, micromolar and 2 millimolar concentrations and the decrease in albumin production was evident as early as three days after the treatment and in fact the albumin production went down with longer duration of treatment with these two higher concentration. So overall monocrotalin significantly affected the function of hepatocytes as measured by albumin production with minimal and transient effect on viability as measured by the, the uh, LDH released into the media. And this was quite expected, um, this kind of uh, toxicity, so that's what we are seeing here. We also looked at the cellular ATP content as a marker of cell viability on both at the end of day 7 treatment and also at the end of day 14 treatment. And as you can see here, there was no reduction in ATP, cellular ATP levels going up to 2 millimolar monocrotalin either after 7 days of treatment or after 14 days of treatment. So essentially monocrotalin did not affect the viability of tissue based on the ATP content but based on what we saw in the previous slide it affected the function of hepatocytes but overall the tissue was viable. We looked into a panel of cytokines um, and what is presented here are the ones that changed significantly. Uh, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 4 and 8, they all increased but only at the highest concentration of monocrotalin treatment. So interestingly all these cytokines are inflammatory cytokines and the increases these increases indicate 
an ongoing inflammatory event or a response, which is also a characteristic of monocrotalin-induced liver pathology. So if you recall in the previous slides, in the mechanism I showed you that there is a good amount of inflammatory component involved in the monocrotalin-induced liver injury. So this was an impressive finding to see increase in the inflammatory cytokines. Now, here is the best part of the study. Uh, personally, I feel this is one of the most attractive features of this model, which is the ability to section the tissues and look for the histologic changes. And these are the HNEs uh, stained sections. On the left hand panel is the untreated or the vehicle control. The inset is uh, higher magnification. On this panel in the middle is the monocrotalin treated tissue. And um, um, as you can see here, the difference between these two is that there is a dissociation of the architecture with monocrotalin treatment. And um, similar observation was made when we did immunostaining for, with e catering and again this is uh, untreated and this is monocrotalin treated and if you can see there is the intensity of staining of e cadherin is slightly lower again representing that uh, monocrotalin induced dissociation of cellular network with a mild reduction in cellularity overall. We also looked at endothelial cells uh, using CD31 uh, immunost immunostaining. On the top panel is the lower magnification at 50x and on the bottom panel is a higher magnification and here is the concentration response and the vehicle on this left hand panel. And uh, what is really interesting here is the change in the pattern of CD31 staining with monocrotalin treatment. With increasing concentration of monocrotalin, the CD31 staining was brighter and it stained larger structures. Monocrotalin induced an increase in CD31 staining cells and brighter and larger CD31 staining structures were observed at higher concentrations. Uh, these findings are suggestive of endothelial remodeling. Again, this is another feature of uh, the monocrotalin pathology. Sections were also stained for uh, alpha smooth muscle actin, um, which is a marker of activated stellate cells. Alpha SMA, um, as I said, it's a marker of activated stellate cells, and activation of stellate cells indicate initiation of uh, profibrotic events. On the top panel is the lower magnification, and here is the higher magnification and staining done for both the alpha smooth muscle actin for um, activated stellate cells and for CD31 marker of endothelial cells. Interestingly, monocrotalin treatment increased alpha SMA staining and this staining was adjacent to the larger CD31 structures. Further, staining with desmin, a marker of stellate cells, showed an overlap with alpha SMA staining, suggesting that indeed these stellate cells were activated with monocrotalin treatment. So monocrotalin induced increase in alpha smooth muscle actin 
staining in the tissue with alpha SMA staining adjacent to the large CD31 staining endothelial cells and overlapped with the desmin expressing stellate cells, suggesting that there is stellate cell activation and initiation of profibrotic events. This is a really nice finding, um, similar to what the pathology that we would anticipate in vivo. So to summarize, monocrotalin treatment of exweave human liver tissue led to both time and dose dependent decreases in tissue health as measured by albumin production. It did not affect the cellular, total cellular ATP and there was only a transient uh, increase in the LDH leakage. There were increases in production of cytokines all inflammatory cytokines, uh, suggesting that there is an inflammatory component on ongoing with monocrotalin uh, treatment. And histologically, there were signs of tissue damage, including dissociation of the network of hepatocytes and reduced cellularity, as we saw from the HND staining and even with the e cadherine staining. And there was dose-dependent increase in CD31 staining cells, which are the endothelial cells, and a marked increase in the appearance of large and bright CD31 staining cells, often forming clusters of complex multicellular structure, uh, which we think is an indicator of vascular remodeling. And there was also dose-dependent changes in organization of the CD31 expressing endothelial cells and the appearance of desmin and alpha-SMA co-expressing stellate cells, indicating of stellate cell activation, tissue remodeling, and initiation of early fibrot fibrotic events. So all these events are components of monocrotalin-induced liver toxicity in vivo. So XV human liver tissue model captured monocrotalin-induced complex multicellular events and also the spectrum of the spatiotemporal changes that are not typically captured by the traditional uh, 2D in vitro systems. And this was our final conclusion from this uh, really interesting study. So with this, I would want to thank um, all the people who were involved in the study, from Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, Wasanthi Baskaran, Yang Wu, and Lois Lehman McKeeman for all the ideas and uh, um, some of the work that was done uh, with immunohistochemistry and uh, Argonovo, the team from Argonovo, uh, for um, uh, providing the XVIV uh, uh, 3D tissues and for conducting uh, the study, Tim Smith, Jeff Ireland, Scott Gridley, and Bill Williams. Overall, it was a great collaboration, very interesting study, and we really challenged the system with a very complicated compound, and we were glad that we were able to capture the pathology that would have occurred in vivo in this in vitro system. So that ends my presentation. So please submit your questions uh, into the questions pane of the control panel. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Imesh. Um, like you were noticing, it is it's a is a very um, interesting uh, session to hear about the findings. It's just so sort of exciting to hear about the different sort of potentials that are behind this um, method. Um, so yes, uh, 
in mind of that, everybody, if you could look to enter your questions in the Q&A um, chat box at the bottom, uh, it's labeled chat. Um, we're now in the Q&A section of our webinar for today, um, so it will be great to get a riveting discussion going. Um, but we, in fact, have another guest with us today. Um, so we have um, Jeff Island, who's the Director of Scientific Applications at Organovo. He will be hosting the Q&A section of the webinar today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an insight into Jeff's work, um, so Jeff holds a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Oregon. As the Director of Scientific Applications, Jeff interfaces with Organovo's customers and R&D team to implement and expand the company's portfolio of service offerings um, utilizing these bioprinted tissue models. And so it's great to have you with us um, here, Jeff. Um, so yes, if, you, if you'd like to get started, um, and just a, another reminder to our attendees, please do have a think and submit your questions as, as we get involved with our discussion today. Thank you to the organizers and uh, especially to Umesh for a very interesting webinar. I think we'll begin with a question that's kind of following up on the, on the summary slide about how this kind of phenotype is difficult to be assessed in 2D systems. And the question is, why can't HUVEX or HUVEX co-cultured with hepatocytes be used to evaluate this kind of toxicity? It, that's a great question, Jeff. So, um, you know, that's the reason I spent a little bit more time um, explaining why we chose monocrotalin. You're absolutely right. If it was a simple toxicity, a 2D system is just enough, like, you know, it could be just hepatocytes or a co-culture of hepatocytes and uh, endothelial cells. But the type of uh, the pathology, the phenotype that we want to see cannot be uh, reproduced in a simple 2D system uh, such as just a co-culture because this is a duration-dependent response. There is vascular remodeling there is fibrotic events, so we need multiple cell types, a longer duration of treatment, and the ability to monitor the changes over this period of time, which clearly we can do it in a 2D system. Thanks, Umesh. Um, we did get a question about the cell, sorry, the tissue model itself, and maybe since the tissue work was done here at Organovo, I'll take that one. Um, the question was, uh, I assume that the transwell system consists of several cell layers. If yes, how many? And do you expect hypoxia to occur in the center? Uh, and that's a question we get a lot. The uh, model itself, uh, tissue model, is, is about um, uh, half a millimeter thick. So it is dozens of hepatocyte cell layers thick. You've got um, those non-parenchymal and parenchymal zones kind of alternating if you're going up and down in the z-plane. And we do not observe much in the, uh, anything in the way of hypoxia in the center of the tissue, either by histology or, uh, as um, Umesh pointed out in the introduction, we see sustained function and viability going out 28 days. And we think it has something to do with the sort of spontaneous organization of those endothelial cells. And it gives the tissue some degree of porosity, uh, which facilitates diffusion in and out of the tissue. So another question about the monocrotaline phenotype. Um, this is about the endothelial remodeling. Are those brighter and larger CD31 stainer, staining structures due to replication or morphology changes or both? Uh, Umesh, can you hear me? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so my my answer was, you know, again, it was a great question. Uh, my answer is uh, likely both. It could be a, a combination of replication and the morphology changes. Although we have not really f done to show that there is a replication, um, you know, we could do some uh, staining with the PCNA. Um, and, and see if there is real replication ongoing. But clearly, um, there is, there is, I, I think there is both uh, uh, replication and uh, the remodeling going on with the endothelial cells. And then there's another kind of related question is, is how does that um, phenotype tie in with the in vivo phenotypes that you showed in the beginning of the webinar? Right. Um, you know, again, um, 
the in the complex pathology, right? So what happens in the liver, as we saw, there is this endothelial damage, and there is tissue remodeling. So to to and there is a lot of uh, matrix metalloproteins is that come into picture in the tissue remodeling, and that that we are capturing here as the vascular remodeling, followed by the activation of stellar cells and fibrosis, which fits in quite well with what we see in vivo. Although in vivo, I wouldn't say there is only vascular remodeling, there is a, 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 the tissue remodeling, but it's all initiated by the vascular damage and then the remodeling events that take place. Good. So we got another question kind of about the general bioprinting process. And again, since the, the tissue model is developed here at Organova, I'll take that one. The question is, what bioink has been used? And does it mimic the liver ECM in some way? <clears throat> um, and the shorter answer to that question is, by the time we do the testing, so by the time we start dosing with monocrotaline in this kind of study, um, the only ECM there is the ECM that's been generated by the cells themselves. In some cases, we do use a temporary ECM, uh, sorry, a temporary bioink that kind of holds the cells together right after printing, uh, but that typically sort of dissolves away over a course of a couple, three days while the cells are generating their own ECM. Uh, so by the time we start dosing with um, any kind of compound in any kind of study, uh, we've got basically a wholly, wholly cellular structure with the, the native or the native-like ECM. Next question is um, asking if there's a kind of discrepancy between the albumin decreasing over time uh, and the very subtle effect on the histology, um, not seeing a lot of hepatocyte damage. So that's for Umesh. Right. Um, yep. Um, again, another great question. So, you know, essentially the markers that we picked, uh, like looking at the the uh, cellular damage uh, by monitoring LDH, which didn't, really didn't show a significant response. Um, so that, that correlates very well with the histology because there was not a lot of dissociation, a lot of loss of hepatocytes uh, as we saw in the HNE staining. So that, that very well says that there is no significant tissue damage, but these hepatocytes are losing their function based on the albumin uh, data that we have. So over time, and with increased concentration of monocrotaline, the cells are not dying. They are they are still viable, but their function is being compromised as we see the albumin production going down uh, with uh, increased dose and duration of treatment. So it fits very well with the with the HNE staining that we saw. Uh, that there is not much of tissue damage, but there is a lot of uh, tissue function over time. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's a question that's kind of following up on the stellate cell activation. Did you see any evidence of fibrosis like, for example, collagen deposition? Yes, um, you know, I, 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 we did uh, look at uh, the collagen deposition by by trichrome straining. Uh, I think that was done on the 14-day trial here. And we did not see an obvious increase in collagen deposition. You know, but that said, I should point out that the the monocrotaline induced fibrosis is not the same way we would see fibrosis with other agents such as uh, methotrexate. Um, it's it's subtle. What we see with monocrotaline is subtle. There are a lot of other events occurring, primarily initiated by the endothelial cell injury, and that's the that was the key aspect of you know testing in this model. Uh, now, that could be one of the reasons why we did not see an increase in collagen deposition or a really um, classic fibrosis uh, endpoint in, in this study. But I believe um, Argonovo has done and uh, shown uh, that if he used other agents that can induce fibrosis, pronounced fibrosis, such as with methotrexate, uh, there is collagen deposition in, that, in, in such treatment. Is that right, Jeff? Am I getting it right here? 
Uh, that's correct. Some of that work was uh, published recently, uh, and, and I think um, it's easily findable on our website. I think uh, we have one more question, uh, and it's, did you verify metabolism of monocrotaline into the reactive uh, pyrrole intermediate? Okay, that's again another great question. So, now we did not, we did not um, monitor the uh, formation of uh, the metabolite due to some technical limitation, but that said, you know, we have done in the past a lot of work with monocrotalin in hepatocytes at the, at the concentrations that we have used and at the cell density that we have used and clearly shown that monocrotalin pyrrole has been formed in an acute treatment and this is no different. So um, our assumption is that given these hepatocytes are healthy and they are expressing the cytochrome P450s very well and we have used the right amount of uh, monocrotalin, there is no doubt that the pyrrole has is formed here. So it, the monocrotalin pyrrole is formed, but we have plans to follow up and, and demonstrate that indeed, you know, the monocrotalin pyrrole is formed and released into the media um, yeah, subsequently. We, we are planning to do that. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for the questions. Okay, great. Thanks very much to Jeff and Dimesh there. Um, just as a reminder to all our panelists, um, today's session will be available on demand. Um, and if you do think of any questions um, at a later stage that you'd like to ask um, Jeff or Dimesh or the organizer team, um, all you can do is um, you can submit your questions in the comment box just below where the on-demand webinar will be hosted. And then we'll make sure that we can facilitate a response um, to you from the organizer team. Um, Okay, well, thanks very much to Jeff and Mesh today. Um, it's great to see us have a little bit of a discussion going there. Um, so, do you have any um, final remarks, Jeff and Mesh, before we before we wrap up for today? No, just thanks from Organovo to all the attendees, to the organizers, and especially to Umesh. Yes, same here. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, to the organizers, Organovo, and um, the opportunity to present uh, a really nice study. Brilliant. Um, yes, well, thanks again for joining us. Um, yeah, so it looks like we're going to finish up a little bit earlier ahead of the hour. Um, so I suppose that gives you a little bit more time to reflect on the findings um, that you sort of listened uh, to today. And I'm sure you've gained a takeaway or two in places. Um, so this marks our last live session, as I mentioned before, for the Predicted Toxicology Academy. Um, so please do visit PharmaIQ in order to browse the resources and also to visit Organovo's first session, um, which opened up the Academy and is available on demand now. So if you didn't get a chance to view that one, please do um, go and uh, go and check that one out. Um, please keep an eye out on our newsletter for any updates. We'll have bonus content that will be released um, over the next coming weeks. Um, but that's us for today. So again, thanks to Organovo, Mesh, and Jeff, and that concludes today's webinar.